Sure. Okay. Um, okay. So we're into a new week and ready to start a new meeting and just uh, glad to have you all who everybody who's shown up. I suspect there'll be a few more that show up as time goes by. Uh, this is one of those weeks that we get to kind of share our thoughts about the last couple weeks and give you as much information as you like. So anybody who want to share anything or anybody who's new, anybody who's old. <laughs> Hi, my name, my name is Angela and I'm sorry, I'm trying to get my camera to work, but it's not working okay. for some reason. But this is my first meeting. I just had my first appointment with Scott last week. So, hi. Welcome, Angela. Thank glad you. To have you. I'm glad, I'm sure Scott is happy that you actually followed his recommendation. <laughs> well, I figured if I don't the first time, I don't know when I will the second time, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that is great. Make it optional early on if they're just getting started. So they can uh, come come whenever they like. Yeah, thank you. Uh, anybody else? So I just wanted to tell you that I had my follow-up colonoscopy last week, the reason I missed last, last week's class, and I'm all clear. So Oh, congratulations to you. Yeah. And no, like no polyps, no nothing, which at each colonoscopy I've had, I've had polyps each time. So that was exciting. And so, so you, you attributed that possibly to possibly what I just doing. I hope that's the case and we'll just roll with it and keep looking forward. So well, congratulations. We're really thrilled for you and thank good you. for you. Thank you. Sure, that's sort of biting your nails for a while while you're waiting for the results on that. Yeah, definitely. I was definitely relieved. Well, now that Velvet has spoken up, um, I just have to get her to continue for just another sentence or two, uh, because I want to thank her for spreading the word, because I learned uh, through my wife from uh, her daughter that uh, there was a meeting down in Medford and at this meeting, um, they actually uh, discussed our classes. And that is uh, because of Velvet's uh, contribution. Maybe you could share how that came about and uh, we wanna thank you. You're welcome. Well, I, we saw a patient that I just felt like I could help. And I've actually handed out the flyer to a few different patients now that were interested. Um, and so my manager was like, well, we need to prove it, approve it through, you know, the company first before we hand out those things. And so we shared it with our clinic and a few people were interested. So we'll see, you know, what happens with it. But it sounds like um, Asante actually contacted Scott and they're interested in promoting these classes. So we'll see what happens and see if it moves forward. So. So we're thrilled. Yeah, it's exciting. So I've just been like here and there talking to patients when I room them and do their vitals. And if they mention anything about like their diet or what's going on, I'll mention what I'm doing and see if they're even interested. Send, so tell them about the class. I don't want to push it on anyone, but yeah, it's exciting. Well, thanks again. You're Robert. welcome. Thank you. That's how this continues to spread bit by bit by bit. Yeah. Where are you, where are you located? I'm in Medford, Oregon. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, Charles. Oh. I'm in Eugene now, Eugene, Oregon. Whereabouts? Uh, North Eugene on Mirror Pond Way. Okay, because at the rehab at the uh, kitchen, there was a, a blackboard and they had written something of it on that same book that I'm reading. 
And I said, I wonder if they have a meeting where you are, but it's not. I didn't I didn't follow through. I didn't ask who it is, but they had all the, the information from the book on the blackboard. Uh, from the uh, How Not to Die book. Uh-huh, yeah. And that so was at McKinsey Willamette Rehab? Yes. Well, that's encouraging to know. <laughs> We're thrilled Next about time that. I'm going to ask them. I meant to ask and I forgot about it. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I need to ask who's going to do that or what's going on. Are there classes or what, you know? Okay. <laughs> Keep it's asking. Like wildfire. <laughs> Keep asking and the word will keep spreading. <laughs> um, anybody else have something that they'd like to offer uh, before we continue on with tonight or any questions or anything that's going on? You don't need to be shy. All right. Well, I have a question. Okay, Velvet. <laughs> you know, I, I was in this cla a class last weekend, and I ended up not even listening this weekend. I wasn't interested, but she said a few things that just I was wondering about. Um, coconut milk. Do you guys use coconut milk? I do. Yeah, I occasionally do a little bit when we make a Thai recipe. Yeah, I use it in like stir fry sometimes or like a Thai type dish. Of course, it's going to be high in saturated fat and whatnot. That's what she was saying. Yeah, so, so just if it's once in a while, a small amount, you know, for most people. Okay. Yeah. That's what I, I was wondering. It. So it just piqued my interest. So I'm like, oh, I better ask about this and look at it. I found just using soy milk works fine. I don't like the taste of soy milk. I oh, made oat milk then. I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you, guys. Yeah, we might use it uh, once, twice a year. Christine may make something because of the saturated fat content. She just feels like going hog wild and having something that has a little bit of that saturated fat in it. But so. You know, it's just one of those things. Yeah, I don't, I, I want to know these things, but I don't want to nitpick completely. But, you know, it's good to know these things and pay attention to how much I'm consuming. So, good. Thank good. you. I use it at, not at all. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Dr. Esselstyn would agree with you not to use anything with oils or saturated fats. Well, uh, mm -hmm. Very rarely do I use the olive oil, but generally not, no, no oil at all. Anybody upset by the no oil concept? Uh, you say, wait a second, why can't we have oil? It's promoted on the internet and, you know, mm -hmm. it seems like a healthy thing for us. Don't we all need oil? Anybody? Uh, Nancy, running it hard. go ahead. Nancy is not going to say I miss my oil. I am going to say for the umpteenth time in these sessions, how clean your kitchen and pans and sponges will be. How easy cleanup will be. It's, it's like a miracle. So yes, you don't want oil to have to clean up anymore. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Well, thanks for adding that. That was one of the first things we noted when we uh, transitioned totally to whole plant foods and didn't do the oil. Uh, we noticed that our dishes were a whole lot easier to clean up. It's a so, blessing. Yeah, it is. For thanks are, for it. And for those that are newer, you, you get plenty of fat in your food just from the food itself. So you know, nuts and seeds and avocados and even broccoli has fat in it. So all there's no such thing as a no fat diet. So as long as you, you know, you're eating food, you're gonna get get the right amount of fat. And so it's not 
not that we're not, you know, because people say, well, you got to have oil for fat. It's like, well, no, you don't. It's processed. You get fat from the food you eat. So, yeah. I have a question. What about if you put the cream on your face? It's got oil in it. It's got fat in it. Does it absorb and get into your bloodstream? No, not in this, not in a significant no. way at all. That, so yeah, if someone's saying I want, I want coconut, use coconut oil. It's like if you put it on your skin, no, that's okay. But no, as long no, as you no, don't, don't eat it, <laughs> yeah, no, on your I skin is fine. Do what? On your skin is okay. Okay, good because I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I don't use coconut oil or coconut unless it is uh, like in the dead of summer. Uh, you know, the um, sunscreen has coconut oil in it. But other than that, I don't No, For instance, now, no, not necessary. I don't like the smell of coconut. On your skin is fine. As a food, not the healthiest choice. No, I, I, I don't like it. Mm -mm. I don't like the taste of it. Okay, anybody else? I have sort of an insane question. Yeah, Edward. Uh, so like my bird here, she gets, you know, seeds and fruit, vegetables as a once in a while treat, but most of her diet consists of pellets. Um, so it's really controlled like that. But my question is, is, is there like a human pellet? <laughs> 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 I think the human pellet, uh, the, the burger companies, uh, Beyond Beef or whatever those companies are, Impossible Burger, they're trying to make the pellet food for us. Oh. Uh, and uh, yet it's a processed form, which is probably not the healthiest. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but What's it's a good question. Okay. <laughs> what about sunflower seeds? <laughs> and that bird is awfully cute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what, what about sunflower seeds? Is that good for the for the bird? Uh, they're a little high in fat. Yeah. Uh, so they're used as a a rare treat mm -hmm. for training. Well, I, I use the uh, walnuts that has oil in it too, but it's a good oil. Yeah, <laughs> walnuts are a much healthier treat than sunflower seeds. Um, mm -hmm. I, they have um, higher quantities of omega-3, the walnuts. A uh, quarter cup a day is probably a reasonable amount. If you, yeah, that's, a clo that's close to 150 calories, which is getting close to 10% of your calories for the day. So um, if you're eating walnuts, you got to be careful about adding on if you're really trying to stay at a Esselstyn type of reverse heart disease diet, you want to kind of avoid some of the avocado and olives and other fats in your diet. I don't uh, have them. Uh, but no. if you don't have any of those problems, then you can have a little bit of avocado, a little bit of olive, whatever for the day and just I don't need it. <laughs> just be aware that um, those um, the foods are you know have a fair amount of fat content mm -hmm. in them the nuts and seeds even though they can be really healthy choices yeah Nancy I do have a question about avocados because you're talking often about a quarter avocado slice are you eating the little bitty avocados or the medium avocados or the great big avocados? <laughs> yeah, so I'd say a medium avocado, a quarter of it, uh, seems like a reason, not the real tiny ones. Um, um, I'd say medium to large is probably okay, a quarter. So I only get the little tiny ones, so. So you get a half. Half, okay, I'll do it right then, okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Anybody else? 
I have a quick question. So um, being new to this plant-based lifestyle change and that what, um, what would you recommend a newbie? Where does, where to start? Where, what did, what helped you to get going? What, like, what was the first thing you changed or? Scott, do you want to start? Sure. I mean, I think it just kind of, well, I went slowly when I started, but I, I mean, I kind of say slowly as I kind of changed all my meals, but not like every meal every day when I first started. But what I usually tell patients, you know, I've learned a lot over the last nine years teaching this to over 2000. So it's kind of, you know, kind of trying to use some of that wisdom. I, I think changing breakfast, just like starting with one meal kind of is a good way to go because it's like, okay, it's instead of bacon and eggs or sugary cereal, I'll do, uh, you know, oatmeal for breakfast or just fruit or even fruit and toast or something like that. So it's just going to depend on where you're coming from, where, what, where, where you want to start and then what your health problems are. I mean, if you're more likely to want to jump in head first into the deep end, then you can go ahead. Or if you want to just go really slow and just change one meal, but that's what I usually would say on that spectrum would be, you know, start with breakfast. And then once you do that for maybe a week or two, that seems pretty easy. Then you can work on like, okay, let's work on lunch now. And so you can kind of slow, go slow, but there's also something to be said for going too slow also because your taste buds won't really change. And so you, if you're only eating one or two plant-based meals a week, then you know, those meals aren't going to ever taste very good because if you're still eating bacon, double cheeseburgers for other meals, then the, the broccoli and the beans and the uh, whole grains and all those foods won't ever, you know, taste very good. But if you go all in, then it, your taste buds change more rapidly. So, um, so that's kind of a, kind of a diverse answer, but I think that it is a complicated uh, question and, and to, to, you know, to define not anything you know, velvet that could want it to add or Charlie wants to add or anybody else for that matter. Yeah. I think the most important thing is to know your reason why you're doing it, because then you'll have a good base on why you're doing it and you'll feel stronger about changing what you're eating and what you're doing. And I had a friend reach out to me and ask me the same thing. She, she was like, is there a beginner's guide for this? I'm like, well, that's a big question. <laughs> There's a lot of ways to do this. Yeah, I I think one of my biggest things is, um, you know, not only feeding myself, but feeding my husband and my daughter. And even though they're supportive of my changes, um, making sure that they're taken care of and that too, even though, you know, they're, everybody's an adult in the household and everybody's responsible for themselves. It's still, you know, kind of that mom thing for me. So. so I have a husband and I have three kids. And so that was one of my things too, but they've been really supportive and basically, you know, they eat whatever they want to eat outside of the house and sometimes they'll go and get lunch and bring it home and that that's up to them but whatever I cook they eat you know mm -hmm. and that's worked that's really well for us but maybe just gradually changing some things and seeing what they like and yeah Scott actually suggested a good book that I think you, you don't have little kids but I think it's plant powered families I have that book and I like I can make like most of the recipes out of it. Okay. Plant power. Plant can, powered can, families. I can show it yeah. on the website when I when I share my screen in a minute. I can show I have it on the I have that cookbook on the cookbook list on the website. So I'll show everybody that. Oh, okay. okay. And they're no, those are good suggestions. So yeah. Those are great suggestions. Thank you. And I wanna share my story briefly. My story is I was afraid of losing my wife and I wasn't willing to um, spend days or weeks or months um, getting her healthy and we both decided to go all in. We just jumped in the pool without any swimming lessons. We pulled out all the foods that were uh, considered not healthy, 
all processed foods, all animal products. Um, and we gave them to our kids, not knowing that uh, this was not really healthy food. We thought it was healthy, but I wasn't really sure. And so we went uh, from pretty much day one, we loaded our house up with beans and with greens and fruits and veggies and started on this path. In the first month, uh, the first couple of weeks, the food was tasting pretty bland. But then by the end of the month, I was feeling pretty good. Hadn't um, had uh, dropped my weight 10 pounds, had um, dropped my cholesterol close to 100 points. And we were hooked from that point on and have never turned back. So it is possible to do this completely uh, if you have the motivation for that. If you have what I say, one foot on the banana peel and one foot in the grave. In other words, you've been told by your doctor, you've got a severe case of diabetes. It's uh, not being well controlled by your medicines. And uh, you know this is problematic or you're having chest pain and you're gonna need to go in and have a bypass. I'd encourage those people to um, do this 100% from day one. But if you're otherwise doing well and just want to do this to improve your health, doing it gradually seems like it makes a lot of sense. And just a note for everybody, if you're not speaking, make sure your microphone's muted. There's been a lot of background noise. Hi, guys. Yes, Mary. Hi. Um, my big problem in life these days is that I, I own a care facility and I'm kind of working around the clock. So finding time. So I'm finding that I'm eating the same things bland over and over. Is there a good local company where I can have uh, good food delivered to me? Silence. I hear well, silence. You about good food. I can't I remember. It. Well, there's the leaf side products, but they aren't, I don't know that they taste very good, but I, I've tried some of them. They haven't been very good, but those are just the ones you add hot water to. Those are more for like traveling. Yeah, yeah. I tried those. There's some of them are good, but not, not a lot. Yeah. You know, like there's an excellent um, program that delivers free food, prepared, you heat it up, and it, there may be some uh, non vegetarian dishes, but it's, um, you could probably request vegetarian or vegan dishes. They, they are, um, they, they, they use the kitchen at Hummingbird Wholesale. Oh. It's a nonprofit. I'll get the name of it before this is over. Uh, <clears throat> but um, yeah, they'll deliver a, a week's worth of at least one meal a day to uh, people that need it, like most of us, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm still, I'm enjoying, uh, I'm learning to cook. I'm learning to use spices and what spices do what. And so it's a whole new world for me. And I wanted to ask is anybody else eat uh, leafy greens for breakfast? <laughs> like yours truly? There's velvet raising a hand. I, my main breakfast is beans of some kind uh, and leafy greens of all kinds. And uh, I enjoy it and I, I go out of the house feeling energized without uh, f feeling stuffed. If I'm gonna have oatmeal, I'll have it later uh, after I've burned a bunch of calories and maybe need some more. But uh, I started out with um, making my own muesli without any sugar added. so. Just uh, it was rolled oats and and raisins and walnuts and such, <clears throat> and then I, I I love the the straight oat groats, which is basically whole oats. I really like those. Uh, and then I trans I I just changed to the um, the less caloric, maybe more protein. Uh, beans and vegetables for my first meal of the day. But like uh, that one person we watched last week, I forgot her name, but she says she eats all day. And I kind of do. But look at what I'm eating. 
<laughs> I eat a lot of radishes and sweet potatoes. Anyway, this is an interesting time in my life. And uh, I have pretty much jumped into it feet first or head first, whichever. <clears throat> Thank you, Ken, for sharing that with the group. There's Megan? Chat there. If you can look in the chat, people wrote down some other ideas there. Uh, Megan. Yeah, hey. Um, so happy I, to see you here, by I'm the way. I'm so happy to be here. I'm <laughs> sad I missed last week for assessments and That's other okay. obligations. Um, but for the question about um, having foods delivered, I, as a crazy busy med student, um, am off. I, I order something called Daily Harvest, which is, it's all frozen, um, but it is vegan. Um, so they can't say that they're fully organic for a couple different reasons. They're actually uh, encouraging conventional farmers to go organic by giving them uh, like contracts. So I think it's a really cool program. So they, they're technically not organic, like fully organic. Anyways, you could read about them, but all of their food is um, like oil-free, uh, salt-free, already made. It's in the freezer. So it does definitely take up like a fair amount of space is my only uh bad thing to say about it but it is really really good food i have it as my backup so that i don't just you know go eat out or something when i'm too busy so highly 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 recommend their stuff what does it taste like uh they have literally everything they have flatbreads which are yeah different kinds of pizza ish i mean it's not actually pizza it's you're going to have like a broccoli crust or sweet potato crust or whatever cauliflower or something. Um, all I'm pretty, no, it's not all grain free. They're really, really amazing, uh, recipes. And then they have like, um, some, they started doing these bakes that are like wild rice, um, and squash. And then they have, um, they have a chili, like a lentil chili. That's really good. They have, I mean, literally hundreds of different foods that you can order from thank you yeah yeah could you uh, put the name in the chat for those who didn't quite get it absolutely i'll do that thank you megan yeah of course thank you uh anyone else i have one more thing yes Velvet. i think it was angela that was asking about you know how to go about this I think Instagram is really helpful. I know it seems silly, but if you have Instagram, go on there and find people that are plant-based and they share all kinds of recipes. You just got to watch for oil, but there's a lot of good plant-based stuff that's shared on there. So my last suggestion. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, I do have one more question real quick. So, um, I haven't, you know, I'm, I'm getting my big toe wet, so <laughs> I haven't jumped in. Um, so I am trying to cut back on coffee and, and all that, but what do you recommend for sugar substitute or not? <laughs> or, or do I have to get going up to my ankle now? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Anybody want to take that question? I use maple syrup. Really? Like whole maple syrup. Okay. I know that you, you shouldn't use a lot of it, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> I'm a date girl. Dates, yes, dates. Date. Date. You can, you can even get a date sugar, which if you look at the ingredients, it says dates. Okay. I, I, I make, a, sorry, I make nice cream and it was just ice, you know, non-dairy ice cream. And yeah, you don't need to, uh, I learned this from Scott, I guess. Yeah, it, you basically just use dates to sweeten it and it, it is very sweet. You can get it very sweet with just whole dates that you chop up real fine. And, and when you put it in your blender, it's just uh, makes it wonderfully sweet. So whatever you do, you can use dates for everything, really. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I didn't know that one. Great. Thank you. 
I'm so thrilled we have two med students here tonight. One of the goals of these classes was to share this information with the upcoming providers who are gonna be responsible for taking care of people in the future and two were able to come and uh, I'm thrilled. Just wanted to let everybody know that this is just not for the oldies in our country. This is for the youngies, the middles and the oldies. <laughs> I just wanted to address the dates a little bit. Yep. So I find that with the date sugar, because I don't use a lot of sweetener, it gets hard and it's almost impossible to get apart. So I'll often take dates and you can either buy or make a date syrup or just keep them whole and chop them when you want something to make it sweet. That's my two bits. Good. All right, let me, I can show, let me show that uh, cookbook on the website real quick. Let me share my screen here. You can see my screen, I'm assuming. Yep, we can see it. Add here on the website. So uh, here's the home page. So uh, under resources, if you, if you hover over it, you can either click on it or hover over it to get to the, each of the sections. If you click on it, it just brings up a whole page of the resources. But uh, here we go, links to cookbooks. And I just added, added one the other day, the one that Velvet told us about, the Plant You book. So this very first one is one she's talking about, Good for Families. It's the, one of the earlier ones we bought as well. So Plant Powered Families by Drina Burton. So we have, you can click on the picture or click on the, this link here. It'll take you to Amazon if you want to get it. Um, I don't, Charlie and I don't have any financial ties to anything on the website. It's just stuff that we use or we have heard a lot of good things about or use ourselves the different books and cookbooks. So, so there's a list of all the different cookbooks, just a handful that we recommend are all here. Um, but that's the one that she was talking about earlier. Those two books are basically what I use to plan my dinners every week. That. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, yeah, uh, let me segue into, uh, I wanted to, since you know, this is open forum for the nutritional myths and other popular diets and diet wars together. I wanted to uh, start off. I've never showed this in class before. Um, I got I got these videos from the International Plant Based Healthcare Conference. I, I've been to a couple of times. Uh, so this is through the Plantrition Project, which is the author of that plant based quick start guide that that uh, I've shared with everybody that wanted it from the introduction class. And then I give it to patients that see me one-on-one -on -one in the clinic and the hard copy of it. Uh, but so that same organization, that nonprofit, the Plantrition Project, pr uh, produced these two videos, one on protein and one on calcium. So let's show the protein one. And then we can then have a discussion about protein and or then or just whatever other questions you guys have. So let's watch this. Are you considering making a switch to a more whole plant-based dietary lifestyle? but wonder where will I get my protein? This is one of the most common questions. So you're not alone. Contrary to popular belief, you don't need to eat meat or get your daily dose of protein. That means you do not need to eat meat, fish, fowl, eggs, and dairy products to get the protein you need. This animal product myth is based on the false belief that having a lot of animal protein is good for us. In fact, the opposite is true because excess animal protein has contributed to many problems related to inflammation and a rise in chronic illnesses and lacks key nutrients and fiber that support health. So first, let's start by answering your question. Where do I get my protein? Getting the protein your body needs is vital. Protein is essential to every cell and organ system in the body. The word protein comes from the Greek word protos, which means of prime importance. For generations, we have been taught that protein is important and that a well-balanced diet will supply all of our protein needs. And though this may make sense, have you ever stopped to ask yourself, what are the best sources of protein in a balanced diet? Or more importantly, what is a balanced diet? To answer those critical nutritional questions, let's start at the very beginning and explore what protein is and how to give your body everything it needs to protect your health and fight disease. 
Protein is one of the three macronutrients, along with fats and carbohydrates. Protein is the main building block of the human body. It makes up our bones, muscles, cartilage, skin, hair, nails, immune cells, enzymes, and even the oxygen-carrying hemoglobin in our blood. In fact, about 17% of our body is made up of protein. Protein is made up of 20 small building blocks called amino acids that combine, like beads on a string, to create different types of proteins. These different proteins that make up things like hair, skin, and nails all serve different functions based on their makeup. But when it comes to making proteins, there are nine essential amino acids that your body could not produce and must instead come from the foods that you eat. And the good news is that these essential amino acids can also be found in plant foods. So how much protein do you need to be healthy? According to the recommended daily allowance, RDA, the average person requires 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight, and athletes have a higher need of up to 1.6 to 1.8 grams per kilogram. These are just ranges, so your actual needs may be slightly lower. For example, most women require approximately 46 grams of protein per day, whereas men often need about 56 grams per day. At first glance, this may seem like a lot of protein. However, the truth is, most people are likely getting too much protein. Research has found that the average person today consumes between 90 to 135 grams of protein on a daily basis. In some cases, it can even be as high as 200 grams. You might think having more protein is a good thing, but excess protein is simply excess calories that inevitably get stored as fat. The extra protein is dangerous and can damage your kidneys, cause conditions like gout, leach calcium from your bones, increase inflammation, and even reduce the healthy functioning of your immune system. And here's an eye-opening fact. Consuming too much animal protein can even contribute to osteoporosis. It's true. See, when we consume excessive animal protein, including dairy products, it creates an acidic environment in our bodies. And in order to neutralize the excess acid, your body pulls calcium from your bones. Then the acid and calcium mixed gets filtered by your kidneys and later get concentrated and excreted in your urine. But don't worry, we'll talk more about this in our Dispelling the Calcium Myth video. Now, though, it's time for some protein myth busting. Myth. Ancient hunter-gatherer groups had a diet that consisted largely of animal products and so should you. Fact. The longest lived and healthiest populations around the world share a dietary pattern that is actually 95% whole food plant-based. When researchers studied the Blue Zones, five regions of the world where people have historically lived the longest and have some of the lowest incidences of chronic disease, they saw one interesting diet trend. They all ate predominantly plant-based foods. Myth. To stay healthy, you need to get all nine essential amino acids in a complete protein, meat, eggs, and dairy are ideal sources. Fact. Your body is extremely intelligent and is able to acquire all of the essential amino acids it needs from the wide variety of foods you eat each day. In fact, research has shown that people who eat a well-balanced, whole food, plant-based diet meet or actually exceed the recommended daily requirement for protein, including all of the essential amino acids. That's because your body breaks down every protein, whether from animal or plant sources, into smaller chains or amino acids. All of these amino acids are then absorbed and used or stored for later. So if you're eating a whole food, plant-based diet, you'll get all of the essential amino acids your body needs and more than enough protein. Myth. The best sources of protein for humans are from meat, fish, fowl, eggs, and dairy. Fact. This is False. You may be surprised to learn that all protein comes from plants. Grass, algae, leaves, grains, and even fruit. As plants grow, they create amino acids from the soil, air, and sun. Animals of all types, from small fish to cows, then eat the plants and absorb the amino acids to grow healthy and strong. So, when you consume meat, you're getting a secondary source of protein. To cut out the protein middle creature, you can go straight to the primary source of protein, plants. Think of it this way. Large grazing animals like cows, gorillas, and elephants are all herbivores. 
meaning they eat only plants, yet they are not lacking in muscle mass. Instead, they're able to grow big and strong just by eating plants, and so will you. Meh. Meat, fish, fowl, eggs, and dairy contain more protein than plant foods. Fact. The truth is, a whole plant food-based diet actually has the same amount of protein as animal-derived foods. Weird, but it's true. This chart shows a comparison of 500 calories of plant-based food versus 500 calories of animal food. Let's take a look at a comparison of diets. Surprising, isn't it? Now you know what your best source of protein really is. Let me repeat. You can get all the protein and the best form you need from plant sources. The next time you go to a restaurant and order a baked potato and veggies, or a bean bowl with brown rice, or a fresh salad with a variety of veggies, and the waiter asks, would you like some protein with that? You'll be able to explain that the potato, rice, beans, greens, and veggies are your protein. If an animal-based Western diet and a whole food, plant-based diet both supply you with enough protein to stay healthy, then the next most important question to answer is, how do you want your protein packaged? If you choose plant-based protein, you'll get an all-natural source of protein that contains vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants to reduce inflammation, phytochemicals to promote healing, fiber to make you feel full, avoid constipation, break down cholesterol and estrogen, and protect against cancer. And that last one is the most important because fiber can only be found in plants. In fact, even though researchers suggest 25 to 35 grams of daily fiber, the average person consumes only 15 to 16 grams of disease-preventing fiber each day. And well below the 70 to 100 grams of fiber the longest living groups consume daily. But if you choose animal protein, you'll get your protein packed with. So you probably guessed it's time to pass the plants, please. And if you're looking for the best sources of plant-based proteins, here they are. All of these foods can be used to make delicious meals, from soups to stews, burritos to curry vegetables, pizza, and more. And the plant protein sources that are best for you are also great for the environment. Talk about a win-win. Did you know that 10 times as much land, water, and energy are required to produce an animal-based diet compared to a plant-based diet? It's true. It takes two football fields of land to feed one person eating an animal-based Western diet every year. However, those same two football fields can feed 14 people each year on a plant-based diet. Now you know. The best source of protein is as close to nature's package as possible. Whole grains, beans and lentils, veggies, fruits, nuts and seeds. These fiber-filled, nutrient-dense, health-protecting, disease-fighting foods provide everything we need to grow healthy and strong, no matter if you are a bookworm or world-class athlete. So, where will you get your protein? Don't forget to say, pass the beans and greens. For more information, ask your healthcare provider or visit www.plantritionproject.org. Sure. Any thoughts or comments about that? I thought it was pretty pretty well done summary of protein. Yes, it was. Anything surprise anybody from that? supposed to stimulate conversation <laughs> okay okay here's some conversation i brought this up before i um have a lot of social contact with um uh people whose lives have been kind of focused on raising livestock including me and um i continually am they lose with that question that he brought up in the video where do you get your protein so that gives me a chance to say some things, but they roll their eyes and walk away. Um, we, we've got a long road ahead of us uh, to uh, convince the masses that uh, <clears throat> we, 
we should eat more food as it was grown and comes right out of the ground. You know, when I say that to almost everybody, they smile and shake their heads yes. Uh, I try to eat my foods as close to the way as they came out of the ground as possible. Good. Yeah, I had a friend over recently and he is super into protein, protein, protein. And he was just asking me about what I was doing. I mean, he asked that question and I'm like, well, you really don't need that much protein and plants have protein in them. And he's like, well, you need more protein than that to build muscle. I'm like, yeah, maybe a little bit more, but not as much. Like he's trying to eat 180 grams of protein a day. And he's like, well, well, he asked me to send him some stuff, you know, and I'm like, well, I'll look for some videos I can send you and stuff. But, and I told him to watch Game Changers, but still he, he just didn't look very convinced. And, wow. you know, just little by little. Well, his kidneys will hate him. <laughs> Well, his wife keeps wanting to go plant-based, so I'll just keep working on her and see where I get with him. Well, protein, <laughs> protein sells. It's been really good marketing. It's it's really just a marketing thing. We go up and down the, the aisles at Costco there in the snack area, and it's all protein, protein. You know, Protein is this, you know, it sells. It's, uh, I mean, that, another good book would be Proteinaholic by uh, Dr. Garth Davis, the bariatric surgeon. He has a he reviews the literature a lot on, on protein, and that's a really good book as well when you're trying to dispel that myth. So yeah, it's just a it's just been good marketing over the over the decades. That's why we're everyone's so you know so dumbstruck with that with that word. It's like that's my least favorite word in nutrition is protein. It's like it's like <laughs> scratching your nails on the chalkboards because it's just it's a non-issue. It's like get enough calories, you get enough protein. It's just not something we should be paying any attention paying any attention to you just you're gonna get you just, it's the food packages like i talked about two weeks ago in the nutritional myths uh class you know how important it is that's just a reductionist kind of non-important thing to have to discuss with people but but we have to because everybody's so brainwashed about the that it's such an important thing it's like well it's not it, it's the packages that you get your protein from and your carbohydrates from and your fats from that's what's important, not the not the actual, just the specific nutrient. So it's the same song and dance, Scott and Velvet, uh, that milk milk is calcium and that's how you build bone. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's advertising and it's marketing and it's lobbyists and all that sort of stuff. It's just all lies <laughs> to keep us unhealthy. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's just focused on the wrong thing. Like T. Colin Campbell says, it's, his quote is, food-based nutrition is far more important than nutrient-based nutrition. And you know, he's been an academic in nutrition for 50 plus years. And by the way, today's T. Colin Campbell's 88th birthday, just, just a shout out to him. So he's one of the, one of the godfathers, the mentors that Charlie and I stand, stand on his shoulders. Yes. I feel like starting this, I had to unlearn everything I had learned. <laughs> yeah. So you guys want to has anyone watch? ever scott has anyone ever told you that uh the reason we have canine teeth is so we can eat protein <laughs> well our canine teeth are not uh they're not really true canine teeth they're incisors and our our, our teeth and jaw are completely different than a carnivore work our you know dr gregor has videos on that and i've seen lectures from anthropologists on on that very topic and uh, Nathan Dominey, I think is his name. He's a, a anthropologist, and yeah, we're we're built like ver actually frugivores is the correct term. Where humans are actually frugivores, so we're, we're designed our anatomy is designed to eat mostly fruit, but we also do well with vegetation because we have long gastrointestinal tracts. So we have kind of the way our jaws are and our teeth are. We're actually more designed for for plants than we are for animals. We're not, we're not at all like carnivores. I, had so, I wish are, they taught that in school. Oh yeah. What, what were you gonna say, Eric? When I was in college, I worked at a primate center uh, studying squirrel monkeys, but of course they had all kind of monkeys. It was in UC Davis 
and they had these, you know, rhesus monkeys, and they had teeth that were like an inch, inch and a half long, these canines, and they didn't feed them meat. You know, they <laughs> there was no meat in their diet. They didn't use those canines for so you look at look at apes and, and monkeys, they have these huge canines and they don't eat meat. So it's it's funny. It's for, I think you said before in a class that it's actually for fighting and for intimidation, right? Domination. Yeah, yeah, for intimidation. I mean, it's also for breaking into nuts and and uh, and fruit, tearing into those. But you're right, there's, uh, there's definitely um, some that, that have grown, evolved to, to do this intimidation thing. Exactly, yeah. So... I meet a lot of people that you you tell them you've changed your lifestyle and like the first thing they say is, oh, you're on the keto diet. Uh, no. Uh, and then I start explaining what I'm doing and they say, oh, I can't eat carbs. I've just put on a whole bunch of weight all of a sudden. So we all know that uh, there's just an incredible video everybody needs to watch about once a month at least. It's um, if you're new, please write this down and watch it as soon as possible. It's uh, Jeff Novick, Calorie Density, How to Eat More and Weigh Less and Live Longer. It is a fantastic video. He shows how he's not, you know, it's not the corn. It's not the corn, it's, it's the processed corn uh, that's causing the problems. And I have it here on the website. Thanks, Ken. So under videos, you just go to videos on the class website. I have the Jeff Novick video because it's one of my favorites, as Ken mentioned. It's right here. Calorie density lecture, Jeff Novick. It's an hour and 19 minutes. It's always here. It's, it's freaking hilarious. <laughs> he is so funny. There it is. So who else has um, something that's on their mind that uh, is either confusing them or that they want to share? There's an iPhone uh, guest, a new one. If you have a question, feel free. Did Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden eat any meat? They didn't. They were not designed for meat. <laughs> not even snake. <laughs> we might be better off if they did eat that serpent. <laughs> you want to hear about calcium then? Want me to show the calcium? Sure. Okay. Go back here. Got it saved on here. We all know that we need a lot of calcium from milk and supplements to build strong bones, right? But is this really true or just a marketing myth? It's time for some myth busting. So why do so many of us, including too many medical professionals, believe that milk does a body good and that calcium supplements are often necessary? Well, one thing is true. It isn't because they have read all of the research articles on bone health. It's because of constant marketing and advertising campaigns about dairy, nutritional supplements, and bone health. We've been told most of our lives that you need to drink milk and or take calcium supplements to have strong bones. In fact, the lowest rates of osteoporosis are found in the countries where dairy is rarely consumed. It's true. So there must be more to the story. So let's learn more about calcium and why it is so important. Calcium is an important mineral in the body, essential to the health of our muscles, nerves, the circulatory and digestive systems. Calcium builds strong bones and supports the health of blood cells, helping our blood to clot when you get injured. Simply put, you can't live without calcium. So you must be sure to get enough of it from your diet. Contrary to popular belief, you can get all of the calcium you need from non-dairy sources. In fact, there are superior whole food sources of calcium that supply all of your needs and build strong bones. Before we look at these superfoods, let's dispel a few more myths about calcium. Myth. 
consuming dairy is the best source of calcium, aside from a calcium supplement, and is the only way to have strong, healthy bones. The truth. Strong bones are not created by simply consuming more calcium. It is the final tally of total calcium at the end of the day based upon three factors. Think of it like a bank account. You may add calcium to your account through your diet and deduct it through unhealthy foods like salt and animal products as well as inactivity and stress. But what is important is what your daily balance is at the end of the day. In other words, the final calcium balance determines the health of the bones. After 30 years old, the key is to maintain and not lose calcium. Let's take a quick look at each of these key steps in determining the calcium balance to discover the secrets of maintaining healthy, strong bones. Consumed, as you can see, dairy is not the only source of calcium. It's not even number one on the list. Truth. A plant-based diet that contains a wide variety of vegetables, seeds, greens, and whole grains will supply all of your body's calcium needs without having to encounter the negative side effects of dairy consumption. Calcium absorbed. There are many factors that can decrease the absorption of calcium, including low vitamin D levels, stress, and even acid-blocking medications such as those for reflux disease. Weight loss surgery and diseases like Crohn's disease can also affect your calcium absorption. Calcium maintained or lost, urine. This is the most important category for adults to maintain healthy bones. Calcium can be lost when it comes into contact with phosphoric acid and carbonated soft drinks, alcohol, tobacco, inactivity, unmanaged stress, or due to hormones like estrogen and medications like corticosteroids. In fact, eating a diet high in animal protein, including dairy consumption, and salt has also been shown to pull calcium out of the bones and increase calcium loss in the urine. The bottom line is, the best way to maintain healthy bones and a healthy body is through living a healthy lifestyle by eating a whole food, plant-based diet, engaging in regular weight-bearing exercise, releasing stress, avoiding alcohol, tobacco, processed foods, and getting a good night's sleep. Keep in mind, dairy is not the only food that contains calcium. Many plant-based foods are excellent sources for providing all the calcium your body needs. In fact, calcium is a mineral that's found in the soil. Cows get their calcium by eating plants that grow up from the soil that contain calcium. So, when you drink the cow's milk, you're getting a secondary source of calcium from the soil of the plant. To the cow, to you. Just as the cows do, you can get all of your calcium your body needs by eating foods that grow from the ground. Whole plant foods, beans, greens, and seeds are rich sources of calcium and are packed with lots of other health-supporting nutrients like fiber, vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients. Whole plant foods improve the absorption of calcium and help to maintain healthy bones. And the best part is the calcium in plants is more easily absorbed by the human body than the calcium in dairy. Research has even found that these same calcium-rich plant foods can prevent, suspend, and reverse diseases like heart disease, type 2 diabetes, asthma, and dementia. So what is the truth about dairy? Why is it not the best source of calcium? And what's in a glass of milk? Every mammal's milk is uniquely designed for the growth of their offspring. And in the case of cow's milk, its primary purpose is to grow a calf from 90 pounds to 1,500 pounds in less than two years. So naturally, it is rich in growth hormone, estrogen, fat, and sugars, all much needed nutrients for the growing calf. Human milk, on the other hand, is designed for the rapid growth of a nervous system and slow body growth. Yet, did you know that humans are the only species who consume the milk of another mammal? Here are additional factors to consider. Why is it so hard to kick the dairy habit? Believe it or not, dairy is almost like an addictive drug. See, giving up dairy may be different because it stimulates the brain's reward center just like other substances such as marijuana, cocaine, or nicotine. Dairy contains substances called casomorphins that trigger the same feel-good sensations that opiates like morphine do. This is likely nature's way of ensuring that baby mammals become attached to their source of nourishment. But this same morphine-like milk-addicted effect happens in adult humans, which just so happens to promote constipation. 
No wonder the laxative industry generates a booming $2 billion each year. Although the thought of giving up dairy products may sound challenging, your taste buds and your body will actually adjust in a few weeks. And you will begin to feel better. And your body will thank you for kicking the habit. Can you have healthy bones on a plant-based diet? The answer is a resounding yes. Your bones and your body will thrive on a whole food plant-based diet. Incorporating these basic lifestyle habits of health. Here are the five pillars for stronger bones and a healthier body. For more information, ask your healthcare provider or visit www.plantritionproject.org. All right, that is done with the videos. Any questions or surprises about calcium? What's the link to asthma? Yeah, it, inflammatory with with well mainly mainly with dairy products, but oh, okay. Yeah, because of because of the high, you know, there's a lot of studies on. I mean, uh, Eric could probably talk about this, uh, being a pediatrician, as far as you know, eczema and constipation, and even maybe type one diabetes, as far as dairy products go. But also asthma. Eric. What was the question again? What's the question again? Oh, just we were talking about the correlation between well, in that in the calcium video they talked about asthma, but I think it, as far as I know, it's more specific to dairy products asthma. But I, I was also referring yeah. to childhood illnesses like you know constipation and maybe type one diabetes, eczema. So. Right, right, right. I think um, you know there's a bunch of of uh, diseases of that that are showing to be fairly well linked to, to dairy consumption, such as even acne, uh, that, you know, for a long time, it was thought that, well, maybe all these, these food connections to acne is not, not real, but, um, so studies looking at many different studies that have been done over the past decades have shown that, yeah, there is a link between dairy and, and acne. But also, yeah, acne and um, you know, the, the biggest, scariest thing is the connection between dairy and type 1 diabetes. This is something that's been known for decades, and pediatricians have known this, but they still recommend drinking milk. Well, I definitely don't, because there's a lot, not only that, but yeah, I think, I think the other biggest scary thing is that just this whole idea of growing a calf to a cow takes a lot of a lot of chemical um, biochemical um, trickery to, to to grow a calf from ninety pounds to fifty hundred pounds in two years, and that is it's just not good for our bodies. And and, and the biggest probably thing is is, is the cancer is is the uh, insulin growth insulin-like growth factor that, that is present. And then, and then on top of that, it's all the inflammation. So I didn't directly answer your question, but there's so many things. And um, we definitely see, uh, so you know, when, when I'm talking to patients, that's one of the first things we'll talk about because they're usually seeing me for one of these things. Uh, I saw a kid today for constipation and constipation is just so, that's also one that's been known for decades and decades that has been um, so closely linked. Um, this girl that I saw today, not only was she constipated, but she was also, she came to see me for constipation. She was like, I think six years old and, uh, and she had heartburn issues. 
So those two link up very closely, the heartburn and constipation. Oftentimes you see these diseases linked together or you see someone who's, um, who's, who's, uh, who's got significant obesity, but they also have significant whatever it is, acne oftentimes and, and constipation. You know, it's like a whole list of things that all kind of travel together. And oftentimes uh, the basis of it is they're drinking just tons of, of dairy. But yeah, meat, meat and dairy. And, uh, you know, again, this may be a little off topic, but but just our guts are not are not set up to eat the, the meat. So kind of shift into the meat, but but just just uh, you've talked before about how carnivores are set up with a long gut, I mean a short gut to, to get rid of that meat, whereas we putrefy that meat. And so so all these problems ensue, whether it's it's uh, dairy, which we're not meant to eat except for our own mother's milk up until age four or five, um, or if we're eating uh, the flesh of another animal. It's just, it just it's pro-inflammatory and it causes so many different problems. So yeah, that was a long-winded way to say, yes, dairy causes a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Hey, yeah. Eric, I have yeah. a question for you, if you don't mind. So my yeah. son, Maurice, here, that's sinking down now because he's nervous. He had actually asked about a week ago, like, well, is milk good for your bones? And I explained to him that it actually can create more problems with your bones. And my husband thought, well, in small amounts, it's fine. But what would you say to that? Yeah, that's a great question, Maurice. You know, I think um, it, I was raised when I was your age. I was told, and everybody was told that in order to have strong teeth and strong bones, we had to drink lots of milk because milk does have calcium in it. It definitely is something that has a fair amount of calcium. But it turns out that it's not. It's it doesn't help our bone situation. So. Um, it's actually my recommendation is not to drink any milk at all and, and do dairy. And the, there's a lot of people that also will think that yogurt is much healthier for some reason. Oh, Greek yogurt because it has probiotics. But I, I, it, I've made my own yogurt for years and I know exactly it's just concentrated milk. And so let's not even do, I, I recommend just trying to cut out, you know, you can eat little bits here and there. Um, but, or drink little bits here and there, but in general, I'd say just cut it out. There's so much good um, plant milk out there. So, you know, try the oat, try the, the almond, the, um, the soy, all these different things. Um, so yeah, yeah, let's, I would stick well, to that. And I think your bones will be much happier actually, even though, even though, dairy milk has protein your bones are going to be happier with the, the plant milk well and thank you, you so much plant. yeah yeah <laughs> maurice right. i have Good one more i have one more comment uh maurice i'd like you to do a research product project and find one other animal species that steals another animal's milk for their food mm -hmm. just any other mammal uh, is there any on earth that does that other than human beings? If you find that, bring it to the meeting next time. Let us oh, know. That would be really helpful. Yeah, check it out, Maurice. All right. <laughs> so do you want to know my husband's comment to that? He said, yeah. well, there, we're, also, there, we're also the only species that has cars and airplanes and <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> It was quite the discussion. Uh, yeah. What well, what I would say to that is okay. So we're we we adapt, right? So you know, seven thousand years ago, when people were starving to death, they figured out how to get calories from dairy, and so we survived. And we would kill animals, and we could hunt, and so we wouldn't starve to death. So that is smart. So if if I was if I was somewhere where it was eat eat dairy and eat. So I, so I don't starve to death. So I so I can't pass on my genes to my to my to my kin. 
then I'm going to eat. You're going to get the calories wherever you can get it before you starve to death. So, you know, there's a there's a point to when we know better, we do better. We we know we don't need meat or dairy, so we're better off. And with that, we're better off without it. And there's so many other choices. We have the luxury of having conscious will, and we can actually make conscious, educated decisions about what we eat for our health. And that, you know, when it's just for survival and starvation, then that's a different story. Well, thank I think you that's guys. a great explanation. You know, you think about, just think about thousands of years ago, civilizations where they had may have a hard time um, getting calories from whatever. You know, maybe maybe they, they lived in a colder environment or whatever. Um, just think how easy it would be once you domesticated a, an animal like a cow to park it next to your house and and uh, get milk from it. It's such an easy form of calories. It's not, you know, they didn't do it for health. They did it for, because yeah, they didn't want to start to death. Exactly. Yeah, so you could tell them, tell them that one. Well, thank you. We've had some fun dinner conversations lately. <laughs> cool. <laughs> hmm. Anyone else? There's also in milk, people that have lactose intolerance, they cannot drink the milk. So they probably are better off. Exactly. Yeah, actually, exactly. It's more, more like something like 70% of the world's population is lactose intolerant. And those of us that are can tolerate dairy, I say myself, you know, before I change my diet, it's mostly Northern European descent that uh, can tolerate dairy. And it actually, they figured out it's actually a genetic mutation. So, so those, so people that can tolerate dairy are mutants, actually. So uh, we actually have had a mute, developed a mutation to be able to digest dairy products. And so, um, but yeah, seventy percent of the world's population does not do well with dairy at all. Yeah, I can't, but I can eat cheese, and I could eat uh, drink the uh, uh, whipping cream. That, that is not whipped. I can use use it, but I don't do that anymore now. <clears throat> That's <laughs> smart not to do that now. There's a question in the chat that was really good. It's uh, why are not calcium why are calcium supplements not good? And uh, and it's because there's actually been some studies that show a slight increased risk of heart attack and stroke with calcium supplementation. The thought the thought is it causes a slight uh, and uh, basically hypercoagulable state in the blood. So it makes your blood more likely to clot. So it kind of causes a little bit of inflammation in the, in the blood and the arteries. And so they're more likely to clot. So that was, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Charlie, but that's, uh, that's why there is some risk with taking a calcium supplement. No, that's it. Increased risk of stroke and heart attack with that. Also osteoporosis too. Well, uh, we, no. I, the osteoporosis, uh, people are prescribed calcium for that, but it doesn't necessarily create more osteoporosis, the calcium. It's more the other factors in your diet, like the protein, yeah. like the, the excess animal protein in the diet uh, yeah. leads to that lack of exercise, lack of vitamin D um exposure are leading to osteoporosis yeah i'm taking some something right now i i have that and i used to eat a lot of cheese uh the the uh, brie cheeses lots of fat <laughs> and all that and of course i gave last time i gave the cheese away um anyway um yeah i take right now aldosterone to um, oppose the um, the excess um, calcium that I lose, but years ago uh, somebody and doctor told me to take uh, a thousand milligram of calcium pills because I did not drink the milk, and uh, that probably was uh, part of causing the the heart problem. Well, potentially, you know, uh, the more calcium supplements you take, the more at risk you are for heart yeah. problems. Yeah. Yes, golly. Yeah, this is Hank. We, uh, 
I've been drinking almond milk and really love it, but I noticed in the ingredients they have added calcium in there. Yeah. Would that be considered a supplement? Uh, it would, uh, but it's um, how much milk are you drinking? Just with our cereal, basically. Yeah, so the amount on your cereal is not going to make a difference. If you were drinking three or four glasses a day, I'd say, you know, like we encourage our kids to do, then I would say that could be problematic. Mm -hmm. but Thank it, you. But it's a healthier option than cow's milk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Dolly, think, yeah. Dolly here. Yes, Dolly. I do have osteoporosis and I've been taking, uh, my doctor had me on um, um, calcium twice a day. <laughs> now I'm nervous. Yeah, so this is a discussion that is probably uh, better held one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. We'd be happy to talk to you about it so we can kind of discuss the issues so that you can make a educated decision for yourself and maybe talk it over with your doctor a bit more and see, because um, we do have an um, uh, actual session. Have you seen our session on bone health or osteoporosis uh, on the archive? If you, Not yet. If you would go to that session, we kind of play the videos, discuss the issues, uh, kind of try to give you guidance as to what you need to focus on, uh, weight-bearing exercise, um, uh, vitamin D uh, supplementation. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you're eating greens and beans, you'll get your calcium. Uh, if you're eating enough of them, you'll probably get enough calcium uh, in your diet in that way. But again, if you're not eating enough, of the greens and beans, then maybe you do have to supplement a little bit. So it's a, a decision that we'd be happy to discuss with you. Uh, if you just send us an email and your phone number, we'll call you and talk. Thanks. Thanks very much. You're welcome. But try to watch that archive file. I don't know, Scott, do you remember what it was on bone health or yeah, it's in, it's in it says, yeah, the topic was osteoporosis. It was last summer and we'll and we'll do it again this summer. So it'll be it'll be coming up in through two or three months, four months, something like that. So because I have the schedule already all as it all goes all the way through the end of October. And so we cover all the same ones we did and then some from 2021. But yeah, if you want to jump ahead, you can go to the website under class archives 2021 and and it's there. Osteoporosis is the topic. Edward, are we going to hear from you or from your bird? Uh, I don't know. Okay, either <laughs> one is fine. <laughs> By her way. Hello, little parakeet. Well, she won't talk, so I will. Um, <laughs> so I just, after having the really sensitive tooth pulled, found out that ice cream is awesome. Uh-huh. Um, but I, I know it's like, I, I can't keep doing this. I got to switch to something else, but, um, so I'm, I, I don't know what other frozen treats are out there. Like, like Eric talked about, just do a uh, frozen bananas. So you, so you peel some bananas, you make sure you peel them first before you freeze them and freeze them in the, in the freezer and then put a couple bananas in your, in your blender throw in, uh, you know, some, if you want to put in some other fruit, some strawberries, blueberries, whatever you like, and then put a little bit of almond milk or soy milk or a little bit of nut milk in there. And you can even throw in a couple, two, three dates if you want it to be a little bit sweeter and then just blend that up. And it's, we call it nice cream. So it's just a banana base. So it's just fruit. Okay. And it's just like ice cream. And if you like chocolate, put in cacao, a tablespoon of that, and it'll, uh, make a chocolate ice cream for you. It's really good. Okay. Thank you. Make sure bananas and blueberries are good too for a frozen dessert. Now, if you don't like the texture from the blender, there is a um, improved texture of ice cream made that with those same ingredients that's called Yonana. Yonana is a ice cream maker that you can uh, run the things through, but you could do this with a regular blender, but some people say it gets a little bit thin. Maybe if they put in a little ice cube or two, it might be a little thicker. 
So you can may need to experiment with that, but it really is a taste treat. Okay, thanks for letting me know. You're if welcome. You're in, if you're interested in a good recipe book for ice cream, my friend Nate Maris, he wrote a good um, recipe book for just ice cream, and it's it has so many different recipes in there. So it's called the inside scoop. Huh. So. Okay, I'll check it out. I just added to the chat, I pasted in um, the Giruti family recipe for uh, Wendy's Frosty, which is definitely not the ingredients in a Wendy's Frosty, but it's got oats and banana. It's really, it's really good. I liked it. <clears throat> Any other thoughts, comments? I just wanted to add, and I'm going to put it in the chat right now. <clears throat> uh, You lost your microphone. <laughs> you lost your microphone, Debbie. Uh, have I been talking the whole time? Can you hear? Barely. Oh, not at all now. Oh. We'll look in the chat and see what you hear you say it's in the chat. I don't know. <laughs> hey, am I? Not muted, so she wrote in there. Switch for good podcast episode, February eleventh, twenty twenty two. Great episode about dairy and what it's like for the dairy cows. Pretty traumatic. Not at all like we are led to believe. So, uh, can you hear me now? Yep, there you are. Okay, so I took that. So uh, I was just going to say, you know, we were, um, Eric, you were talking about the family cow at the side of your house, but the factory farm situation is very, very different. And so I just like to think about our own health, the health of the animals we share the planet with and, and the planet itself. And um, Dotsy Bosch is one of the two gals that uh, are the moderators for that podcast. And she was the um, their whole podcast is sort of about let's ditch the dairy and they're very funny and warm and interesting to listen to. And, and they interviewed a woman who worked at a dairy farm and, and what she has to say now and how she became an advocate for ditching the dairy. So it's very uh, interesting. So I just wanted to add that comment. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. You have a question, Evie and Doug, have your hand up. Yeah. yeah, Charlie, earlier in the program, you mentioned something about, I guess, uh, maximum amount of percentage of fat you should have in your diet. I think it's relating to maybe reversing uh, plaque. Yeah, yes. Repeat that, please. Yeah, so Dr. Esselstyn uh, recommends uh, 10 to 15%, uh, as close to 10% of your diet uh, in fat as possible. Um, I think that uh, that's pretty strict, um, but that was what was important for those people who kept having their heart attacks and kept having bypasses and were, five of them were told, you're not going to live the year out. Um, so it was a very strict uh, way of dealing with the fat in the diet. That's, you know, no nuts and seeds, 
um, no avocados, no olives, no processed oils, just the fat that you got from the whole foods is grown in nature, no coconuts. Um, you know, if you're not at that stage where you're uh, contemplating going in for a procedure, uh, like a bypass, uh, you know, doing 15% of your diet uh, in total fat seems not unreasonable from my take. Uh, I think most people who are doing a whole food plant-based diet or maybe doing 20% uh, perhaps if they're staying pretty close to doing um, mostly, you know, 95% whole plant foods. That's my guess. But for those people who are eating the standard American diet fare, they're getting 30, 40 or more percent of fat in their diet. That help? Yeah, thank you. So 20% well. would be, you'd think be appropriate for most people? I think 20% is not unreasonable if you're otherwise doing okay and your health is reasonably good, then 20% uh, is like uh, if if your calories for the day are uh, 1,500 to 2,000 calories a day, um, if it's 1,500 calories a day uh, for to maintain your health, then that would be like 300 calories worth of fat. So that would be a quarter cup of nuts, which is about 150, and then maybe a little avocado and a couple olives and whatever else. And you're kind of up to the 20%. Okay. Yeah, I, I was trying to gain weight. I've been losing weight. I'm so in. if you're trying to gain weight, then, um, you know, some more beans, uh, some more uh, rice, oatmeal, quinoa, uh, the lentils and the whole grains and potatoes are probably a good good choice. Scott, do you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, and you can, you know, dried fruit, you know, some dried fruit because it's a little more calorie dense than the than the fresh fruit. That's it. That's the, and if you are going to eat a few nuts, if you're not, if you're not too worried about the 20 or you're right around that 20%, like Charlie was talking about, probably a couple of handfuls of nuts or a little nut butter. Um, and, and then maybe even you choose to even have a little bit of bread, you know, because that's well, you know, 1200 calories a pound. So if you're trying to really put on some weight. You know, it's just a matter of getting some more calories in. And, uh, but those are things that are pretty high in calorie density. So those yellow light foods, like we talked about in the calorie density lecture, you know, a few more of those in your diet to, if you're trying to actually gain a little bit of weight. Okay, thank you. I have the same problem. I'm losing weight too. And I'm just made note of it. It's rice, potatoes, lentils, oats, and beans. So um, I will work on that. Okay. And if, and if that doesn't work, add some nuts, seeds, nut butters, dried fruit, and some bread. I don't like oils. Uh, the nut butter has oil in it. But I take a, cu a quarter cup of nuts, the, the walnuts. Yeah, that's good. Uh -huh. that, that's enough fat for me. Okay. But I, I have lots and lots of energy with that kind of a, a diet. And it's amazing. And just for the Maybe record, I did not have before. No. And just for the record, nut nut butters don't have added oil. It's just it's just the natural fats that are in the nuts. It's just a. It swims a lot of times in oil. I I've had nut butter. Oh yeah, well, that's why it's really high in calories. Most most people are trying to lose weight, so they want to avoid that anyway. So. <laughs> and I don't eat bread, so um, because of the yeast, I'm allergic to the yeast. Um, so the nut butter, I don't know where I would put it on. So I just leave that off. The nuts is good enough, the walnuts. I okay. have a quarter cup. But uh, probably increase more on the rice, brown rice, right? Yeah, it's brown rice and get it from California because rice from other places oftentimes has arsenic in it. Uh, there may be a little arsenic oh. in uh, California rice, but it's the low, least amount and it's the one that would be preferable. We've switched to eating a little bit more potatoes than rice because of that issue. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't know. I have the rice right now. I don't know where it came from. Yeah. Well, <laughs> just some another issue to just think about, you know, that's what I, makes this fun. It's not, you know, like totally all easy and all the answers are known. Uh, there's a bit of mystery in all this that we keep adjusting to. I finish it up and then it gets California rice. There you that's go. That's my, my whole system goes. I finish some of the things up and when I have new things that somebody bought for me, I just get rid of it. I give it away. But systematically, one thing after another, I add it till I got it completely done. I don't need anything else no more. My taste buds are already adjusted to it. But I have to watch the salt. I need to put more salt in it because I don't like salt. I can eat everything without salt. <laughs> okay. But then I don't drink enough. You see, that's a problem. <laughs> it, uh, life can have challenges. Evie and Doug. It, can anyone tell me where they uh, purchased the uh, California brown rice? We got we get ours at Fred Meyer. It's just in a bag. I think it, I think it says California on it. You just want to make sure it doesn't come from the, the highest arsenic is in the the southeast, so like Alabama, Arkansas, down there, because the the fertilizers they use to grow cotton years especially years ago had arsenic in them and so that's still in the soil down there from growing cotton fertilizer so but california tended to use the least sundance buys um lenberg rice for usually from california thank you what's it called uh lenberg it's a brand l-a-n-d l-u-l-u-n D E E R G. Lundberg rice. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And this is Fred Myers? Um, I get mine at Sundance. Oh, Sundance. Okay. Yeah, little by little, I get it straightened out. <laughs> Next week's class is uh, diabetes, so we're gonna I'm gonna do part one on diabetes, and then the following week Charlie will do part two on diabetes. That's what's coming up next couple weeks. Thank nobody, you guys. Nobody in my family has diabetes, but but they all have the heart attack, heart attack or stroke. <laughs> it's a diet they have. Yep. Class I mean. <laughs> I may not be here next week. We're leaving to Colorado on Friday to go visit some friends. Wow. So, where are you going? Um, My son is living in Colorado. Where do you Denver. go? Denver. Oh, Close yeah. to Denver. Yeah. yeah. He's for the much further south. <laughs> yeah. So, have a good week if I don't see you guys. Have a good Thank time. <laughs> okay. Well, enjoy. Nice being with you all, and we'll catch you uh, next time around. Scott, thanks a bunch. Thank right. you. Bye. Everybody else. Thank you. Coming. Yeah, I learned great. a lot this time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I learned a lot. <laughs> hey, Charlie. Yes, Ken. Did you see my um, chat about my androgen therapy? Uh, no, I did. So they want me to take, the urologist wants me to take 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day from a pill. Mm -mm. And I'm no wondering, good. well, can I just eat 1,200 calorie or 1,200 milligrams a day of uh, calcium in my beans and leafy greens? That would be kind of hard to do. I think uh, what you'll get in, in your food is probably closer to 500 to 700 um, milligrams a day if you're eating uh, a good amount, three servings of beans, uh, several servings of dark green leafies. So uh, you're probably not gonna get a full 1200 is my take, uh, but uh, it probably would be adequate. What are you taking it for? Androgen therapy. Um, Firmagon, 
is the name of the Farmagon. infection, Firmagon. Um, it's uh, um, Scott. Do you know anything about that? I don't really. I'm not familiar with that. I, my it's guess a, is, is it similar to Lupron. Yes, it's okay. a testosterone blocker. Right. So because of the testosterone blocker, they're worried you're going to develop osteoporosis. So it's just a matter of, you know, because taking extra calcium is not going to prevent osteoporosis. It's your diet and lifestyle that's going to prevent osteoporosis. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that's kind of the bottom line. It's, you know, our calcium requirements in America are, the, are higher than anywhere in the world by almost two thirds. And so really six or 700 milligrams a day is, is more than enough for, for people. But if you're, you know, I would say if you're eating the standard American diet, smoking and not exercising, then you probably would benefit from, you probably would need the calcium supplement. So if you're, but since you're not, you're following a whole food plant-based diet, as long as you're not smoking, getting your exercise, I think you sh shouldn't really be worried about getting, I think you'll be getting plenty of calcium to, do, to kind of reverse the effects of the, the testosterone blockers. So that's, that's, that's the reason for it because of the, you know, testosterone is protective against osteoporosis, which is why women have more osteoporosis than men do uh, on average. Because the testosterone is protective. Are you doing vitamin D3? Taking vitamin oh, D3? Oh, yeah. How much? Oh, yeah. oh 2,000? That much. 5,000? I deal with too many numbers to remember any of them. So um, I could answer that in a minute. Oh, I can't remember. I, I went through all that today. And, and now, okay. I'm getting there. Um, okay, they want me to take 400 D3. 